Good morning. Welcome to Chapel Street Kesslinger Campus. My name is Blake Lawson. I am one of our pastoral residents. It is a joy to worship Christ with you all today. A few uh, quick announcements before we dive in. Uh, first, a couple updates from our student missions. A team of 15 students and seven leaders just spent their spring breaks serving at the Cabo Ministry Center with Pastor Ramon and Venencia. The focus of their trip was to finish this season strong and to start the next season even stronger. They had a great time serving together, having fun, and having intentional faith conversations throughout the week. We also have three teams heading out this summer to Twin Cities, Cabo, and Ecuador. About 150 more students and leaders are preparing to serve this spring. One way that you can be involved is uh, by praying for these teams and uh, considering contributing financially. We also want to invite you to our annual student missions auction on Sunday, April 28th, at, uh, right here at our Kesslinger campus. There will be tons of fun stuff going on, as you can see on the screen there, including engaging activities for kids and young families, silent auction baskets, raffle items, and live auction items for family outings, sports packages, weekend getaways, and a whole lot more. So we hope you will join us for that, and you can register at the link at chapelstreet.church news. One other thing to be aware of, we have our annual VBS coming up and in about two months, and we need your help to make it a success. We're looking for volunteers for a wide variety of roles for our three weeks of VBS between June 10th and June 28th. We have one evening option and two daytime options at our Kesslinger campus and our North Aurora campus. And we're looking for volunteers for both hands-on positions and support roles. So if you would consider that, we would uh, appreciate that. We are also in need of some summer substitutes for our weekend programming in the nursery and the kids station uh, for all campuses. So we would ask you to check out the uh, kiosk in the lobby uh, to see all of the available roles and uh, to sign up to serve. Just as a reminder, you can view all of these announcements again uh, and much more information at chapelstreet.church slash news. Okay, with all of that being said, if you guys uh, would please stand for our call to worship from Psalm 148. Come and let us praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights above. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his heavenly hosts. Praise him, you sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for at his command they were created. Praise the Lord from all the earth, you great sea creatures and all ocean depths, you mountains and all hills, you fruit trees and all cedars, wild animals and all cattle, small creatures and flying birds, kings of the earth and all nations, princes and all rulers on earth, young men and young women, the elderly and the children, praise the name of the Lord. For his name alone is exalted. His splendor is above the heavens and the earth. Amen.
in righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest frame but wholly trust in Jesus' name week after Easter, we celebrate he's Christ alone, our cornerstone. The week after we celebrate his death and resurrection, we can sing full-hearted that he has risen and that he is Christ alone. He makes us the weak strong. And in that last verse, we can look forward to his coming again. Let us be dressed, robed in righteousness, and call Christ our own, our Savior, our solid rock. It says all throughout the Psalms, David and others, Christ put him up on a rock, a solid rock, a firm foundation. So our response this morning is to say thank you. Our response this morning is to worship, to call him worthy, to call him holy. So let's continue to do that today.
thousand generations falling down in worship to sing the song of ages to the Lamb. And all who've gone before us and all who will believe will sing the song of ages to the Lamb. Your name is the highest, your name is the greatest, your name stands above them all. All thrones and dominions, all powers and possessions, your name stands above them all. And the angels cry. Revelation 4, we read that the angels, the seraphim, all the beings in heaven are declaring this song, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. 
They've been singing it from eternity and they will sing it through eternity. And it's in times like this, with songs like this, that we can enter into that eternal song. We can join our voices with the angels and say, holy, holy, holy. It's the Lord God Almighty. He is worthy of our praise today. Guys, thank you for singing, for praising, for worshiping, for calling him worthy and holy. Let's have a seat. The Lord gave this message to Jonah, son of Amittai. Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh. Announce my judgment against it, because I have seen how wicked its people are. But Jonah got up and went in the opposite direction to get away from the Lord. Well, good morning. Welcome. I'm so glad you're here with us. Welcome to those who are with us online as well. Excited to jump into uh, the story of Jonah and to experience that together. But before we do, I want to take a moment, uh, gentlemen, to invite you to be a part of our upcoming men's conference here uh, later in April in just a couple of weeks now. Our theme this year is going to be living in the victory of Christ. Um, and Pastor John Kelly from Chicago West Bible Church is going to be our keynote speaker. Uh, Danny Flores, our friend who's been here before as well, is going to share a part of his story. And I just want you to know that, that you are going to um, be encouraged. You're going to be challenged and convicted. You're going to grow and be strengthened as a result of, of experiencing this together. And so I know we all have a lot going on. I know there's a lot of priorities warring in our lives and, and vying for our attention. But I, I want to really encourage you to make this a priority, to be a part of this with us, uh, because I think we are going to be better for it and, and really be pointed to Jesus collectively as, as a community of, of men. So we'd love to have you be a part of of that as well, but not only you. Um, you may have a friend or a neighbor or a coworker or just somebody that God has placed in, in your circle. And, and my sense is that there is a whole um, group of people who, who are under our, or in our influence that would benefit from this as well. So invite them to be, to be a part of you. For again, for those online, um, encourage you, if you live here locally, to come be a part of, of this event. It's going to be really great. And we are looking forward to it. Um, there are people in history, right, where if they're so inseparably linked together, where if I were to say one of their names, you intuitively think of the other person. For instance, Adam and Right. Abbott and... Okay, so everybody over 50 is, uh, got that one. Batman and... Bonnie and... Simon and... Jonah and the... Yeah, right? Like we just intrinsically link this story with, with the whale, with this big fish that's in it. And the story of this Old Testament prophet that, that is, is forever linked to the big fish who just shows up in a, a couple of verses has a way of sort of producing in us, resulting in this, this kind of experience of this book where we've reduced it in a way to almost like a spiritual Aesop's fable where there is this, this opportunity to kind of apply this, this moral rule in our lives. And in this case, it's, it's more or less a version of there are severe potential consequences when we live in disobedience to God. Namely, that we might be swallowed by a fish and live in its innards for a couple of days, be vomited back up and ultimately still have to fulfill the call of God that he's placed in our lives, right? Like, that's why we teach this story to kids. Like, we want them, you don't want to be like Jonah, right? Like, you, 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 you better listen to me kind of thing. It's got everything that we need for a kid's story. It's got a good moral point, and it's got animals, right? And that makes, like, so we go to the creation story, we go to Noah's Ark, 
right? When, when that gets painted on the walls of the nursery, like Noah and his wife are on the boat and they look like they're on a pleasure cruise and there's like a couple like animals up there cutely painted, but there's never like dead bodies floating in the water around them. That's a much darker story, right? The problem with this approach to the story of Jonah and, and others that we have a tendency to do this with is that it ultimately results in us missing what this book is intended to convey. Why it was ultimately written, which is far more about the, the character and the purposes of God and how the covenant people of God are called into that experience. And, and in this case, they are living in such a way where they have forgotten and neglected his character and purpose. And like all of scripture, it's designed to point us to Jesus. Jesus, when, when he is describing his own redemptive purposes, his own redemptive story, he cites the example of Jonah in the Gospel of Matthew. He says this in Matthew chapter 12, for just as Jonah was in the belly of a huge fish for three days and three nights, so the son of man will be in the heart of the earth for three days and the three nights. He cites a previous redemptive story in order to forecast and point them forward to what he's ultimately going to accomplish. And so today, as you and I dive into a familiar story for many of us, a story that sometimes we enter into and we feel like we already know. I, I wanna begin by encouraging us to lay down our assumptions, to really invite us to look at this with a fresh perspective, a fresh set of eyes and a heart willing to receive, to be challenged. And I think if we do this well, to be convicted and ultimately to be reminded and engaged in God's purposes in our world. So with that said, let's pray together and we'll turn to Jonah chapter one. Jesus, we do just thank you for, for where we've already been this morning, for being able to come together and worship, to be able to acknowledge your name and your presence here with us. And Holy Spirit, we pray that as we enter into your word, that you would continue to reveal to us the nature, character, and purposes of our God, that we might align, align our hearts and vision with his. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. If you have your Bibles, let's turn to Jonah chapter one. In fact, I would encourage, if you're not in the habit of bringing like a physical Bible with you to church, I, I, uh, I want to encourage you in this series, we're going to really work through Jonah chapter by chapter. And, and I think when you experience it and see it kind of in its context, it helps ground it in the larger story of God. So if you have a Bible, um, I encourage you to bring it with you as we start working through this together. Same again, if you're at home online, press pause for a minute, go grab your Bible and, and we'll open up to Jonah 1. And this is how the story begins. Verse 1, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Get up. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because their evil has come before me. Jonah, Jonah got up to flee to Tarshish from the Lord's presence. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. He paid the fare and he went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the Lord's presence. Let's pause there for a moment. The beginning of this story, it starts with a call to the prophet. God calls on the prophet, I have something for you. There's a message I want you to deliver. In this case, it says, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it. To which Jonah says, no, thank you. There's a part of this, right, where we can, again, with our familiarity with the story, we, we have this part of us that says, oh, no, Jonah, right? But we also get this. Just a few weeks ago, I was uh, flipping through the news on my phone, something like that, and saw this story where the, the head coach of the Chicago Bears, Matt Eberflus, was at a Marquette basketball game. And he was sitting next to the head coach of the Green Bay Packers, uh, Matt LaFleur. And, uh, and it turns out Matt Eberflus, the Bears head coach, was taking his daughter on a college visit. Matt LaFleur was just there because a friend of his gave him some tickets to 
to the game, but they ended up sitting together. And the next day on like uh, uh, social media, st sports talk radio, people were like outraged. Like what can the Bears head coach do be sitting with the Green Bay's Packers head coach? Like there is something that this should not be allowed, right? Like they're probably trading secrets and that sort of thing. If they are, I hope we learn something personally like <laughs> from that. And, and, and it's something as trivial as like a, a sports rivalry, right? Now, even like listening to it, there was a part of me that like at first was like, yeah, he probably shouldn't be there. But we get this sense of, of, of how we can separate into like the unacceptable. Like I, I can't go there in our hearts and our minds. And so this story opens up in a place of conflict. There are, are divergent visions between Jonah and between Yahweh. And it's easy again for us to look at this from our perspective and to think, oh, Jonah, like this does not end well for you. But there's more to the story. And before we get there, I want to just take a few moments and, and talk a bit about what we're reading here, like the type of literature this is. Because first of all, Jonah is, is a unique, really, among all the other prophetic books in the Bible. It starts the same way. It, it starts with God saying, the word of the Lord came to Jonah. That's, that's repeated in a number of the Old Testament prophets books. But then instead of being a record of this prophetic message, like it is in the other prophets, we get a story about the prophet. But the prophetic message doesn't even show up until Jonah chapter three. And when it does, it's a total of seven words long in the English language. But Jonah just says, in 40 days, Nineveh will be demolished. End of sermon. I have preached some clunkers in my day, right? <laughs> but I like to think that I've put in a, a little more effort than what Jonah seems to be showing here. The book of Jonah instead is this record of the message, instead of being a record of the message of God's prophet, it's a message to God's people through the story of God's prophet. And this, this book then is designed to challenge us as well, for us to consider some things about our own hearts and our own approach to life. Secondly is is Nineveh, where God is sending Jonah. Nineveh is, at this time, like 700 to 800 BC. It is the largest city in, in the world. It's influential. It's the capital of the Assyrian Empire. And the Assyrian Empire, arguably, is one of the most cruel and violent empires in all of human history. In fact, we have artifacts from this era that was recorded by, by the Assyrians where they are celebrating their brutality. In some cases, skinning victims alive so that the conquered people can watch their leaders die in front of them. There's artifacts where, where they have essentially skewers with severed heads on them that are paraded through so people know what they're up against. In one case, there's a recording of, of their victim being dismembered one limb at a time and leaving one arm so that they can shake his hand as he dies. Just brutality and cruelty. Women and children were not spared. So at one level, we can hear this, we can sympathize with, with Jonah's resistance. But what's interesting here is Jonah's Jonah's desire to flee doesn't seem to be born out of fear, but rather out of hatred. For, the, for Jonah, the thought of God's mercy being offered to Nineveh is offensive. It goes beyond the boundaries of, of grace. And so what we discover in this book is that Jonah's operating in this place of, of tribalism and nationalism and judgmentalism and his own sense of, of justice on his terms. And as a result, he says, I can't go there. That, that is a, a bridge too far. Thirdly, then, it's important for us to understand the, the, the type of literature that 
that Jonah is. And, and this isn't immediately perceptible to us, but in the original, to the original audience, like they would have understood this to be satire and a, a prophetic narrative parable, um, which isn't to say that it isn't historic. Jonah is a historic figure. In fact, we can read in, in 2 Kings, Jonah, we see Jonah uh, offering another prophetic word to Jeroboam II, a king in, in the northern kingdom of, of Israel. And again, there's some things in that prophetic message where you see Jonah kind of leaning into sort of this tribalism mindset there. So Jonah is a historic figure, but it's written in such a way, this satire is such a part of this that that you discover yourself laughing at the story of Jonah before you realize that this is written as a critique of, of you, right? I don't know if you've ever experienced that where like you're laughing at a joke before you realize you are the punchline kind of thing. That's a little bit what it, it looks like to read the story of Jonah together. Just to point this out, I, I saw this from Tim Mackey and he was talking about how just that, in that very first sentence, like the, the satire begins right there because Jonah, son of Amittai, just that phrase in the Hebrew, that means like the, na the name, the word Jonah means dove, which is this symbol of peace and innocence. Son of Amittai, Amittai means faithfulness. So it's dove, son of faithfulness, right? Who is going to be the one running away from, from God. It starts on page one, sentence one. Mackey goes on to say that Jonah is a representative character in this book, representing the covenant people of God through whom God wants to do his work in the world. Jonah is designed to wake us up to the worst tendencies that exist among God's people. And so now when Yahweh goes to Jonah and he says, I'm sending you to Nineveh. Jonah runs in the opposite direction. Look again at verse three here. It says, Jonah got up to flee to Tarshish from the Lord's presence. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. He paid the fare and he went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the Lord's presence. Again, like it's just, it's, it's ripe with sort of this irony. Just to kind of give us some perspective here, I wanted to put this up here. Yeah, yeah so you see, you, you, again, you see what the author is, is, is showing us here. As far as way as you can get from Nineveh is Tarshish. And Tarshish, in fact, it, on the other side of that is the Atlantic Ocean. So in the known world at the time, this is it. There is no further west to go. This is as far as you can possibly flee. Jonah's desire is to flee. He's going to flee the Lord's presence, which again is ridiculous. Where can you go to flee the Lord's presence? Certainly not Tarshish. Jonah would have known the Psalms. He would have read Psalm 139. He knows that what David wrote when he said, where can I go to escape your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. That's going to become relevant in a few verses. If I live at the eastern horizon or settle in the western limits, Tarshish, even your hand will lead me. Your right hand will hold on to me. In other words, Jonah is on a fool's errand. And Jonah is playing the part of the fool. His obstinance and his, his hard-heartedness are now in full view as he flees from the calling that God's placed in his life. And God's calling now, this is rooted in what God has been doing among his covenant people from the very outset. When God called Abraham to be a separated family, living in covenant relationship with God, he established purpose and intent in that. In Genesis chapter 12, when God is calling Abraham out, he says this, he says, I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and I'll make your name great and you will be a blessing. 
I will bless those who bless you and I will curse anyone that treats you with contempt. And to that point, I think Jonah's like, okay, I'm with you. And he says, all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. And that's where Jonah has a problem. Jonah's a firm believer in the first half of this part of the Abrahamic covenant. The promise of blessing neglecting, entirely overlooking what else it says there. That all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. Somewhere in the heart of Jonah, somewhere in the heart of of God's covenant people, they have co-opted this this blessing as something that is for us and not for them. Not for Nineveh. That's a bridge too far. I think it's interesting to note here, when we were just in the Gospel of John when we were um, leading up to Easter, that when you see Jesus in the New Testament, what people, particularly with kind of in the, the religious structure of the time, what people found so offensive, so bothersome about Jesus is his willingness to step outside of the us-them boundaries and go sit and have a meal with tax collectors and sinners and the people who are clearly outside of the boundaries of grace. And Jesus is constantly eating with them and talking with them and doing life with them. And and if that wasn't bad enough, inviting them to be his followers, calling them to be his disciples. And when you're working, you're operating in this structure that says there's, there's us and there's in, them and, and this is for us and it's not for them. What Jesus did was offensive. As the church, right, through the blood of Jesus, we have been grafted into this covenant purpose. So the question that Jonah forces us to consider is what is a bridge too far for me? For us. And to be frank, to be honest, I wonder sometimes if that bridge isn't, isn't far more um, accessible, I guess would be the word, right? It's far easier for me to build a bridge than, than maybe even what Joan is referring to here. Sometimes it's just like, you want me to go talk to that neighbor? It's like you ask one question and they talk for 20 minutes. I don't want to go over there. Did you see that? sign in their yard. Like we have nothing in common. I don't want to go over there, whatever it is in our hearts and minds. I think Jonah forces us to consider the question, where have I co-opted the mercy and grace of God in order to make it something that is for me, for us, and not for them? Because where that exists in me, right? And if, if, Christians on Twitter are any indicator. It is alive and well out there. The story of Jonah intends to expose it and it intends to give us a vision that, that, uh, to reveal that we have a vision that is in conflict with God's purposes in this world. And when that conflict exists, right, the prophet flees. But God pursues Look at the the ongoing part of the story. This is the pursuit of the prophet, picking it up now in verse four. It says, but the Lord threw a great wind onto the sea and such a great storm arose on the sea that the ship threatened to break apart. The sailors were afraid and each one cried out to his God. They threw the ship's cargo into the sea to lighten the load. Meanwhile, Jonah had gone down to the lowest part of the vessel and had stretched out and fallen into a deep sleep. The captain approached him and said, what are you doing sound asleep? Get up, call to your God. Maybe this God will consider us and we won't perish. Come on, the sailors said to each other, let's cast lots. Then we'll know who's to blame for this trouble we're in. So they cast lots and the lot singled out Jonah. Then they said to him, Tell us who is to blame for this trouble we're in. What is your business? Where are you from? What is your country and what people are you from? Verse nine, he answered them, I am a Hebrew 
I worship the Lord, the God of the heavens, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were seized by a great fear and said to him, what is this you've done? The men knew he was fleeing from the Lord's presence because he had told them. Let's pause there. Just notice the way that Jonah is, is described, his condition in these verses. First off, the, the author does this and it's subtle, but notice the repetition of the word down. Don't, Jonah went down to Joppa. He went down into the ship. Later he goes down into the lower, lowest part of the vessel. Like Jonah is portrayed in this, this trajectory spiral away from the calling and purposes of Yahweh. And then it describes him in verse five, it says that he had fallen into a deep sleep. You know that feeling, right? My, I am one of those people, like, if I fall asleep on the couch and I get to like, oh, he's asleep level, the process of waking me up and getting me to my bedroom is next to impossible. And my wife and my daughters will tell you some, some hilarious things have happened in our home when I have been kind of in that state of like sleepiness, trying to make my way to our room because I'm confused and I'm disoriented and I end up like in the basement, like facing a wall kind of thing. Like I just, like we're completely operating out of any ability to function with purpose and intent. And so this is where the author places Jonah it's this spiral into complete and total apathy. Like he could not care less for the people of Nineveh, which results in disobedience. But Yahweh, God does not leave him there. In verse four, he threw a great storm, a great wind onto the sea. In other words, God said, let's wake him up. Let's, let's pursue him. Again, let's, let's pause here for a moment to just consider what this reveals about the nature and the heart of God. At one level, God could easily just say, you know what, Jonah, have your way. Like, just do your thing. I, he's, I can call another prophet. God could in divine ways convey his own voice over the city of Nineveh so that they could refuse like any other option but but repenting and turning to him. We look at the storm and we look at what unfolds and, and the fear and the terror that must be in that. And yet of all the things, the potential things that could happen to Jonah, the greatest tragedy, tragedy would have, have been for God not to pursue him, to leave him to his own devices. What unfolds in Jonah's life is God's mercy to him. And once again here, the, the, the humor is, is thick. The assumptions and, and expectations that we would place on the characters in a story such as this have completely been flipped on their heads. The prophet, the man of God is at sleep at the wheel. And then there's this group of pagan polytheistic sailors and they're the ones discovering being awakened to who the one true God is. Jonah's asleep. The sailors, on the other hand, are, are crying out to their various gods. They're taking like the, the scattershot approach, right? Like this is, a, again, it's a polytheistic group of people. They're all like, everybody pray to your God and maybe we'll figure out who's upset and can appease the one that's doing this. All to no avail. It's not until the, again, the pagan captain of the ship discovers that Jonah is asleep. And look at verse six, he says, get up, call to your God. Maybe this God will consider us and we won't perish. It's the, the pagan captain of the ship that suggests to Jonah, hey, maybe you ought to join us in praying here because we're in real trouble. They start to ask some follow-up questions and then they, it says they cast lots, this ancient dice game. And God allows that to expose Jonah in this moment. And so the sailors want to know who he is and what's going on. And look at his answer in verse 9. He says, he answered them, I'm a Hebrew. I worship, that the ESV translates that as fear. 
It's that, that word we see in the Psalms and wisdom literature all the time, the fear of the Lord, revering, understanding who he is, the awe of God. I worship the Lord, the God of the heavens, who made the sea and the dry land. So you can almost like picture the expression on the sailors' faces, right? Like, do you think that could be relevant to our current circumstances kind of thing? And then notice verse 10. Then they were seized with a great fear. Same word that, that was just translated worship. In the irony here, the prophet, the man of God who claims to worship Yahweh is in total disobedience, total neglect of his purpose. There is a display of, of religious hypocrisy here that is like a caricature. It's so sort of poignant. It's all exaggerated. He claims to speak God's word to his people, and yet he's running from God's purpose. Remember, Jonah is a representative character. But as we, as we interact with this, it's, it's designed to cause us to look inward. But God is pursuing him. And it's in that pursuit that these sailors who are completely devoid of faith, they don't know Yahweh. They are beginning to discover who Jonah's God is. And it says they fear him as the God who created the heavens and, and the dry land, the seas. Which leads us then to, to the prophet's condition or, or his diagnosis, if you will. Now back in, in verse 11. It says, so they said to him, what should we do to you so that the sea will calm down for us? For the sea was getting worse and worse. He answered them, pick me up and throw me into the sea and it will calm down for you. For I know that I am to blame for this great storm that is against you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry land. So they couldn't, but they couldn't because the sea was raging against them more and more. So they called out to the Lord, please, Lord, don't let us perish because of this man's life and don't charge us with innocent blood for you, Lord, have done just as you please. Then they picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea and the sea stopped raging. The men were seized by great fear of the Lord and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows What does it take to get your attention? What does it take for us to, to be awakened? Now we've come to, at this point in the story, discover really where Jonah's at. His spiritual disconnect between his own heart and his own purposes and the purpose of God. Jonah's instruction to these sailors in light of what they're facing is to say themselves, despite their own resistance to this, they, they give everything they have. They've already thrown their cargo overboard. They're trying in every effort to row back to, to dry land. He says, your only option is to throw me into the sea. His commentators are, are divided on this. Some understand this to be an act of compassion by Jonah a sense of Jonah's willingness to sacrifice himself in order to save the sailors. My own personal take is that an act of, of repentance would have accomplished that. In fact, I think Jonah's answer revealed the degree to which his hatred for Nineveh and his commitment to making sure that they do uh, not experience the mercy of God has now metastasized in his heart and his mind. I think this is Jonah saying, do you know what guarantees that I don't go to Nineveh? Throw me into the sea. In other words, I, I would rather die than see Nineveh repent. The conviction in his heart that the mercy of God is for him and for his people and not for them and for those people has become so pervasive that he would rather die then align his heart with the purposes of God. And again, here in these verses, it's, it's these pagan sailors. They're the ones who are praying to Yahweh. 
They're the ones who at the end in verse 16 offer sacrifices to him and, and, and make vows to him. They come to a place of faith and the prophet is plunged into the sea. If you've ever had the experience, and I'm sure many of you had babysitting or um, uh, being responsible for like a toddler in your life, you know the sense in which like, if you go outside and you, you have like a two or a three year old and you wanna go outside to play, as soon as you set them down, right? What do they do? They run to whatever is the most dangerous and likely to kill them thing in view, right? So it's either I'm, I'm gonna go straight to the road or I'm, there's a loose dog over here and I'm gonna go pet it and it's like a pit bull or a, whatever. Like, it's, I know, anyways, I'm not gonna, sorry. I offended all the pit bull people now. <laughs> And I did not intend to do that. Um, I know there's nice pit bulls. I, and I feel like I've lost the moment here. Like, in that sense, as a parent or a guardian or a friend where you are constantly chasing after them, redirecting them. No, that's, that's not life. That's not good for you. That's not where my purposes are Go Like, okay, reroute. Like, this is where we find ourselves in, in Jonah chapter one, where Jonah, this representative character of the people of God, and you see them running away to, to what in their mind seems reasonable and good, but is outside of God's desire and his purposes. Jonah is convinced at this part of the story that life for him lies in Tarshish. And we see God pursuing him and redirecting him, saying, no, I, I'm doing something in Nineveh. I'm taking you there, something miraculous, something only God could do, and I want you to be there for it. Jonah is written as a wake-up call to the covenant people of God. It is designed to hold up a mirror to us as Jesus followers and invites us to see where, where we have potentially made the gospel and the proclamation thereof a commodity that we hoard together, that we keep to ourselves. Or maybe in our best moments, right, we're willing to kind of share it with those that we deem are worthy. And when we're operating that way, we, like Jonah, are operating out of a place of self-righteousness. We're operating as religious hypocrites. We're out of alignment with the purposes and the covenant of God. And Jonah is written to remind us how God chases us down in that and redirects us. Because he loves us. Because he wants us to be a part of the work he's doing. You may have noticed that that I stopped short, one verse short in Jonah chapter one. It's probably the most famous verse in, in all of Jonah. It's the verse that we're all expecting. But I'm gonna pause there and we're gonna pick it up there next week where God acts in miraculous ways for Jonah's redemption and his salvation. But for now, I want us to sit in what Jonah is intended to do, to cause us to look inward to ask ourselves, where am I operating in conflict with the purposes and the character of God? Let's pray together. Jesus, thank you for this time. This time to be in your word, time to worship together, and time to be reminded of your work, your purposes in this world. And God, where I have operated in conflict with that, Jesus, would you reveal that? Would you expose that in my heart and mind and us as your, as your church so that we can confess it and bring it to you, Lord, that in repentance we can be redirected to your vision for this world, that, that through your covenant people, everyone would, would experience the blessing of God. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Play for all to see.
that song just reorients us um, to God's pursuit, his willingness to chase us down, that we can, in fact, run to him. This morning, if we can pray with you, uh, we, our prayer team is available. They're in the glass room out back. We invite you to join us uh, for that. Maybe that's your story right now. Maybe you have been in a season of running and you're tired and you're exhausted and God has been chasing you down. We'd love to pray with you. If you came prepared to give this morning, our generosity boxes are by our our doors. As you leave, we are so grateful for all the ways that you participate with us and and the work that we believe God has called us to here in this community and ultimately uh, around the world. Now receive this morning's benediction. 
Go now in the name of the God who pursues, who pursued us all the way by sending his son Jesus, who would take on the cross and overcome sin and death in the grave, and who chases us down so that we would fulfill his purposes in this world. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.